I'm super pleased to be introducing our speaker today, Michaelis Mihalitsis, um, or as we know him in the lab, Mike. Mike hails from Greece originally, but most recently he was a PhD student at James Cook University in Australia, which maybe some of you know is sort of this uh, center of activity, the biggest center of activity of coral reef biology pretty much in the world at this point. Um, and while he was there, he studied reef fish and ultimately came here to join my lab where he's helping me figure out some of the sort of mysterious things about fish that feed by chewing on the reef, uh, which turns out to be a really interesting functional problem. Uh, but basically what you're gonna see today is that what Mike really understands really well is how the morphology of fish on reefs relates to what they do ecologically. And he just loves connecting those two pieces, the morphology and the ecology. Um, so take it away, Mike. Thanks for that introduction here. And thank you all for being here. Um, so today I'm gonna to be telling you about basically what I did throughout my PhD, um, which like Peter said, I did at James Cook University in Australia. Well, it all started about 25 to 30 years ago. Um, obligatory stall. <laughs> I mean, this was working. Nope. Right. Well, it all started 25 to 30 years ago, where um, <laughs> well, as you can see, I was obsessed with being in the water or fishing or dressing up as Halloween creatures or <laughs> marine creatures for Halloween. Um, and Basically, as I got older, this passion uh, grew stronger and anything that was relating to fish was a big part of my life. And then about eight years ago, I found myself in Australia doing a master's in marine biology and ecology. And at that point I did a minor research project there uh, studying Cyberus fishes, which is basically fish that feed on other fish. And well, because of that project, uh, I then ended up doing a PhD later on on these predator prey interactions. And because of that project, I got a basic understanding of like what the literature was saying at this point and what some of the things we knew. And um, some things that really struck out in the literature about this was that first of all, there's a lot of piscivorous fish on coral reefs. In fact, up to 53% of species on a coral reef can be regarded as being piscivorous. And one of the issues we have is that these fish are actually also primary targets for fisheries worldwide and are diminishing at um, fast rates. The problem is that we don't know what fun ecological functions are being removed from the reef through these removals. In other words, is it the same if we remove this piscivore as opposed to removing this piscivore from the reef? The other thing that uh, became very evident was that um, piscivory has been found to be able to influence the community structures and ecosystem dynamics of coral reef fish communities. And that comes from a particular field within predation studies that use these patch reef experiments, where some patches of reef will have predators and then for others, the predators will have been removed. And then after a certain amount of time, um, you can basically census the reefs and see that there's some differences, like you can see in the plot here. So on the x-axis, you have the time plus manipulation, and on the y-axis, you have um, the number of fish on these um, on, on 
these places. And you can see that there's some big differences after four to five weeks. Now, one of the issues with the study, with this, these types of studies, is that they only tell us about the after effect. So after predation has happened, they don't really tell us a lot about the moment of predation. So the moment of capture, we don't really know about when, where, or how these predator interactions occur. The last thing that um, really struck out in the literature was that almost everything we knew about this process on reefs was based on these gut content analyses. Basically, what that is, is that you get a hold of a predator, you open up its guts and see what's inside. Now, if you're like me, that's a little bit like Christmas where you open up presents because it's just you never know what you're going to find in there. Um, and these studies have actually been really important in telling us some basic things about who the predators are and what are the main species of prey they might be feeding on. However, once again, we have the same issue that they tell us information after the predation event has occurred. Again, we don't know about how, when, or where the actual moment of capture, how that works based on these studies. So from these things, I can see that it's actually really difficult to study passivity on a reef. Some of the reasons being that, first of all, we have some logistical difficulties, like for example, the gut content analysis I just told you about. Well, 50% of the time where you would open up a predator, the guts are actually empty and um, you can't really get any information. So in other words, you need to catch a lot of fish for a small yield of data. The other thing is that whilst this process occurs on a reef every day, all the time at a community level, for the individual predator that we're looking at and a research team would be looking at, um, it only happens a few times uh, throughout the day. So, um, it's relatively infrequent, and even when it does occur, it only lasts a few milliseconds, thus creating further issues in someone going down to the reef and uh, putting a camera um, to, to study it. Like, you can't really do this as opposed to other groups like herbivorous fishes, for example. So if any of you have ever been on a reef, you will see parrot fish and surgeon fish munching on the reef. And then lastly, um, is the time of predation events. So there's a lot of studies that have suggested that a lot of predation takes place at nighttime and crepuscular hours, uh, thus making it, again, uh, pretty difficult to study. So because of these issues, I realized we still had some fundamental questions that still had not been answered about this process on reefs. Um, like, for example, how do fish feed on fish? Do they all do it the same way? Who are the main piscivores on a reef? And does the prey influence this interaction in any way? Basically, these questions became the aims of my thesis and what I'm gonna be expanding on today uh, for you guys. So for my first two chapters, um, what I wanted to do was to get a basic understanding of what might be driving this diversity of all these isomers. Can we, how do we understand them better? Can we put them into some certain groups, um, how they belong together? And the way I did that was through morphology. So just to give you a quick example, um, functional morphology has actually been a pretty useful tool um, throughout the years and elucidating on these, uh, on the life history of these animals. Uh, so, for example, this is uh, Lachnolamus maximus, the hawkfish that lives in the Caribbean by feeding on um, mollusks and um, other uh, things with an exoskeleton, which it feeds on by breaking the exoskeleton with this second set of jaws that it has in its throat called the pharyngeal jaws. 
Um, and what Peter here did in 1987 was uh, actually look at the morphology of this feeding system and uh, found that it was the morphology was really good at predicting the maximal capabilities of what this fish was able to do. Thus, creating a causal link between its morphology and what was shaping its fundamental niche. But what about Pisciverus fishes? So Pisciverus fishes come in all kinds of shapes, sizes, colors, and so on. Um, so the way I started with disentangling the diversity for these fishes was to get a hold of some online photographs where the fish were displayed laterally, like you can see, and had their size recorded as well, which allowed me to take some morphological measurements, which we knew beforehand uh, were associated with the lifestyle of these animals and some behaviors in terms of how they live in the wild. I did that for 348 individuals for 119 species from 19 families. And here I'd like you to pay particular attention to measurement E, which is the maxilla maxilla length, or just basically the jaw length. And the reason for that is because um, that minor research project I told you about before doing my, doing my masters, um, one thing I did for that was to basically establish the maximum prey size that uh, a silver fish are able to feed on, just like with the lacrolamus that I just told you about. And I found that uh, basically this uh, gate here, the horizontal oral gate, is a really good predictor for that. So I wanted to see if uh, we could use this as a proxy for this. So I got a hold of some actual specimens as well. And, um, took both of those measurements. So more of that later. But first, I wanna show you the main uh, result here. So what you see here is a phylogenetic PCA. So basically what this is, is uh, if you don't know what this is, is, every dot is a species, and the closer the dots are together, the more morphologically similar they are. And we found three major eco-morphotypes as we call them, um, the way we defined that was um, species that were morphologically distinct from others, but also reflected some part of their ecology or lifestyle. Um, and we found diurnal benthic piscivores, nocturnal and pelagic uh, piscivores. Now, while these ecomorphotypes are mainly uh, separated along PC2, which is mostly associated with uh, the fin shape. PC1 is the one that explains most of the variation. And you'll notice that that's mostly associated with the jaw length that I was telling you up there, which actually turned out to have a, a good correlation there, suggesting that we can use this measurement as, um, as a proxy. And that's what that measurement looks like for our ecomorphotypes. So basically on the y-axis, you have the residuals for the gape size. What this means is that um, if you're above the dashed line, your gape size is larger than what would be expected given your body size. And if you're under, your gape size is smaller than what would be expected given your body size. <clears throat> So there was no significant difference between the ecomorphotypes, but we found quite a bit of variation within them, like the monolithic ones. So what can we use this information to, for to say something about potentially their ecology? Well, we know that this measurement is linked to the maximum prey size that these fishes are able to feed on. So what this is suggesting is that we have a continuum or a separation between large prey eaters and small prey eaters, basically. So if you look at the trophic pyramid that I've made here in the, um, in the middle, on each side, you have um, two predators of exactly the same body size, but 
very different game sizes, suggesting that these fishes are actually uh, might be feeding on while well, they're both they're both isivores, but might be feeding on very different species in the wild. So just to summarize here, um, we have three main ecomorphotypes and a potential separation between um, small versus large prey eaters. But one other thing that became evident for me from this chapter was that if I was to better understand the diversity of all these fish, I needed to look more deeply into the feeding related morphology of these, uh, of these fish. Um, and one thing I decided to look on was uh, something that had not actually been looked at a lot before or quantified and was likely to be really important in elucidating further on what these fishes do in terms of feeding. Um, and that is um, fish teeth. So if you think about it, Fish teeth are the first point of contact between predator and its prey, unless they're doing suction, but that's another story. Um, but after going through the literature, I realized that um, most of the classifications we had for this, uh, for teeth, were actually describing a single tooth, whereas fish can have up to hundreds of teeth in their mouths and are likely working more as a, as a whole unit as opposed to one working individually. So I wanted to establish uh, some morphological traits that would capture uh, fish teeth as a whole dentition as opposed to a single tooth. The way I did that was to get a hold of some fish specimens and uh, basically have their mouths open and take with uh, pins and take some photographs um, and establish some morphological measurements. And then also look at um, what we call jaw lever ratios. So these are some functional traits that um, tell us about a trade-off between velocity and force that a jaw can have. So uh, more elongated jaws, for example, might have a fast jaw closing, but not a lot of force. Whereas um, a jaw that looks like this might have more um, slower closing, but with more force. And what this does is actually, it can tell us a little bit about the potential nature of the prey that they might be feeding on. So for example, if you're feeding on a fish uh, or something else with a soft, uh, with a soft uh, skin uh, and it's elusive, you might need to have a fast, grabbing jaw, whereas if you're feeding on something that has a hard exoskeleton, you might want to have a force advantage instead. Okay, so this is what we found here when we looked at the uh, morphology. Um, what you see here is a distinction between three different morphotypes based on the dentition morphological traits. We have a dentulated villiform and macrodont, where edentulates were the ones that had no teeth or teeth that were too small to be seen with the naked eye. Villiforms, which were basically fish that had small teeth with uh, in a lot of rows. Um, and macrodonts, which had a single row of teeth broadly spaced apart and large in size. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we looked at some extra stuff with the macrodonts and found that there was another axis of variation with, um, in terms of where the largest tooth was. So some of them had the largest tooth at the front of the jaw, whereas others had it at the back of the jaw. So we termed them front fanged and back fanged. Um, and here's what they look like. So we have the uh, morphological trait space telling us that there's these distinct morphotypes. However, 
when we looked at the functional trait space, it told us a little bit of a different story with edentulates and villiforms overlapping a bit more and macrodons being more distinct, suggesting that um, the edentulates and the villiforms have, may have a bit of a different feeding behavior or how they manipulate prey uh, as opposed to macrodons. More on that later. So ultimately what this means is that we were able to make some uh, hypotheses as to how these different dentitions are working and how the fish that are equipped with them are able to use them. So for example, some dentitions might be better for capturing and puncturing their prey, gripping and cutting, piercing, capturing and holding on, and so on. So we have these dentitions and we say, okay, we think they feed this way. And just to summarize, we have these three dentitions. And when we look at them functionally, it suggests two groups. So the next thing was to actually put all of that to the test and see, okay, do they actually do this, uh, what we think they do? Which leads me to my next chapter, um, where I try to basically answer the questions of how do Pisiris fish feed? How do they strike at, capture, and process their prey? And do they all do it the same way? So the way I did that was to through some uh, aquarium-based performance experiments between a pred predators and prey. I used uh, Acanthochromis polyacanthus as, or which is basically a damselfish, um, as a prey. I used nineteen different species of predator and had one between one and three individuals per species of predator. I filmed those events with both a GoPro and a high-speed camera. So the GoPro would capture the whole event in real time and the high-speed camera, just the moment of cap capture, because remember it's something that happens within milliseconds. And I had uh, 10 trials per individual uh, predator. So three years after doing those experiments, the first thing that I found was that the major thing that struck out in their morphology was basically their myology. So the muscle morphology that they had for closing the, 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 the lower jaw. The macrodons had large jaw closing muscles, whereas the edentulate had the smallest ones and the villiforms were somewhere in the middle. And again, here we see this continuum suggesting these differences in, in how they feed. Now, first, if we look at if we look first at the striking behavior, we see some significant differences. Um, so here you have on the x-axis is the strike distance in terms of the predator's body length. And on the y-axis, you see the strike angle uh, from where the strike was initiated relative to the prey. And what this is basically telling us is that macrodons had a long uh, distance, strike distance from a horizontal um, angle. The villiforms had a short distance strike from high angle below the prey. And the edentulates had a short strike distance and a high angle above the prey. Now, if we look at the capturing behavior, we have on the x-axis again, the different morphotypes. And on the y-axis, we have basically what we term grabbing and engulfing. Grabbing, we define as when the predator would get a hold of the prey somewhere on the body, but most of the times tail first, would uh, continue on to do these like head shake to immobilize the prey would spit it out and then re-ingest it head first. Whereas engulfing was basically the whole prey being uh, swallowed whole immediately or being grabbed head first so it couldn't escape and then uh, being swallowed uh, whole. 
So this is basically what the three morphotypes did. The macrodonts were primarily using the grabbing capturing behavior and the villiforms and edentulates were using the engulfing uh, behavior. So basically we have the macrodons doing one thing and the villiform and edentulates doing another thing, which funny enough is exactly what the functional trait space sort of suggested to us in the, in the previous chapter. So what I want you to take from this is that basically not all isomorphs on the reef are the same. You have two major functional groups that strike at, capture, and process their prey in fundamentally different ways. So, okay, so far I've been talking to you a lot about the predators, but when it comes to predator-prey interactions, we also need to look at the prey, which brings me to my next chapter. What about fishes as prey? So what I did here was to go through the literature and find morphological and behavioral traits that had already been established as uh, anti-predatory. And just to give you an example, um, we know that on reefs, uh, antivorous fishes can be found throughout the day up in the water column eating. And then the moment they get startled, they instantly retreat back to um, the full structure. So it might be important to know the distance between you and shelter, because um, depending on that distance and how fast you can get back, it might determine life and death for you. It also might determine, depending on where your position in the, in the water column you are, which predator might be striking at you? Is it a trevally that is swimming by or is it something that is striking from the reef structure? We also know that the body depth of a fish is functionally important is in telling us basically what gape sizes or what mouths are able to feed on you because the larger your body depth, um, the more difficult it is to fit in a mouth, right? And we also know that things like schooling and other social behaviors in fish, fishes have been found to have um, multiple anti-predatory benefits. So we have all these morphological and behavioral traits uh, that had been looked at in uh, on their own, but. I wanted to basically take all of those and put them in a the context of a coral reef fish community and see what they look like. So basically, I wanted to quantify morphological and behavioral anti-predatory traits at a community level and answer questions like, uh, which ones are the most prevalent in the community, where on the reef are different types of prey available, and uh, what gape sizes are these prey available for? The way I did that was to uh, go in the field on uh, Lizard Island and Orpheus Island, which are found on the Great Barrier Reef. If you ever get a chance to go, I highly recommend it. Um, and what we basically did was have two divers swim along a transect, and one diver would take a photo of the fish on the reef in their natural position. And then a second diver would move in and place this quadrant here. And then the first diver would basically retake the same photo. And um, the reason of that quadrant is basically for scaling and measuring purposes later on in computer software, where we could get like distances from the ventos and things like that. The other thing we did after was to overlay a net over uh, within that quadrate and um, collect, allowing us to collect uh, the fish within there, 
Um, basically, we used a claw boiling technique, which is something that puts, puts the fish to a permanent sleep. Um, and then we took, these, we took them back to the lab and uh, basically took morphological measurements and, uh, and so on. Um, what we found, so here if you have the length of the size of the, of the fish and on the y-axis you have the, the distance from the benthos, which remember um, might tell us about the distance from shelter is that um, social schooling fishes were found to be higher up in the water column, whereas fishes that are found to be solitary were closer to the substratum. And already there, we can see that, okay, that we have some different groups in terms of prey that are in different locations on the reef throughout the day. So you might think, okay, if I'm a predator, I need to have these traits to catch this type of prey or these type of traits to catch this type of prey and so on. The other thing we look, when we look further into sol sol solitary fishes was the important behavioral trait with small ones being uh, sitting on the substratum and larger solitary ones, uh, the bigger they got, the higher we found them in the water column, in the water column basically. Um, so again, some different distinctions between anti-predatory uh, traits within the solitary ones. And we, lastly, we also found that the social fishes had significantly higher um, body depths than the solitary fishes presumably because they're more exposed out in the open. Basically, we seem to have these three different types of prey fishes um, to, to summarize it. Um, small bodied cryptobenthic fishes that sit, that are elongate and sit on the benthos, presumably to camouflage themselves. The solitary and the benthic, which are larger in body size and more uh, body that swim in the water column but in close proximity to the reef. And then the social or schooling ones which are deep bodied primarily plankton floors that uh, throughout the day can be found higher up in the water column. So these different groups reflect again the we can start making some inferences as to where, when, and how do these predation events occur, and we're beginning to realize that it's actually context dependent, and the nature of the prey is something we need to take into account, as opposed to only looking at the abilities of the predator. So for my last uh, chapter, so I had all of these predators' abilities, how they differ, um, different groups of predators, different groups of prey, so at the end, I wanted to basically take all of that information and basically take all the pieces of the puzzle and see what the big picture uh, looked like for predation on reefs. And the way I did that was to get a hold of a data set of a fish community uh, survey by a colleague of mine who uh, went to Lizard Island and basically surveyed the fish community all the way up from large trevallies, all the way down to the small, small gobies. And had also recorded all the body sizes for this fish community. And what I did was to basically take those body sizes and convert them to body depths based on relationship, established relationships I had from previous chapters and, and from the literature and then get a hold of the carnivorous fishes and turn the body sizes into gape sizes, basically. And um, again, based on previous relationships I, I had and, and the literature. And then I had the functional groups of predators, I had the different groups of prey, 
And then what I did was to get a hold of those 32,218 fishes and put them into their respective groups. And then basically construct an algorithm which like drew from a random pool of prey and predator fishes, recording the relationship between the predator's gape size and the prey's body depth. And then based on that number, I could actually know how realistic that predation event would have been in the wild. So for example, a relationship of one would have been the gape size of the predator is equal to the body depth of the prey. So that's your maximum hit from the mouth. So something that's you know 1.3 is you can't, you can't do it. So one of the first things that I that I found was that basically the predators that we have been considering as the main predators on reefs. So if I say what's the most common predator on a reef, people usually think sharks, moray eels, barracudas, trevallies, and so on. The first thing we found was actually the most average predator is just 3.65 centimeters. Um, and it's these things here, things like pseudochromids and plesiopids, which are basically small predators in, in high abundance that you don't really see when you go uh, scuba diving on a reef because they have this cryptic behavior. In fact, I conducted a literature review where I tried to find all published um, predation events from gut content analyses um, that had information on predators and the prey they had eaten, as well as the different body sizes. And what I found was that these events actually only represented 5% of the predation events you would expect to see happen on a reef. So the last thing is that I also wanted to see how well those simulations of predation agreed with the observed proportion of predation events based on the meta-analysis. So what you have here is on the x-axis, you have different um, predator body size bins. And on the y-axis, you have the relative percentage that each prey group would contribute to a bin. So, for example, let's say that for zero to five, you had a thousand predation events. Then, how many, what a percentage of that would be social prey, epibenthic prey, and cryptobenthic prey? And all of that needs to add up to one, right? So, this is what that looks like. Um, the dashed line is the simulated, and then the other one is the observed. And overall, you can see that there was a general agreement between the two, except for when you got when we got down to uh, small predator sizes. So what this basically tells us is that the the predators that are that we found are the most important ones are also the ones that we know the least about. So in summary, from this chapter, we have found that the average predator on a reef is much smaller than previously thought, and that these prey functional groups uh, broadly reflect these predation interactions in a coral reef fish community. So for my thesis summary, basically, not all pisivores are the same, they all they, they, we have distinct groups that capture, uh, strike at, and process their prey in different ways. Predation is context dependent, and we need to consider uh, the nature of the prey as well. So we need to see the predator-prey interactions as opposed to only the predators. And hopefully with all this, we now have a better understanding of how predation might be working on um, on coral reefs, and it allows us to expand the questions that we can ask now about this process.
with that, I'd like to thank all these people who helped me out with my, throughout my PhD, without whom I would not have been able to do it in the same manner. And with that, I'll thank you and I'll take any questions. That was really interesting. I don't know anything about fish. So with the with the smaller predator species, I'm wondering like what kinds of ways you might be able to observe, like get at some observations of predation events. Yeah, that's a good question. Um the issue. So this three studies, if I remember correctly, uh of people that have dived on a reef, found a predator, and just sat there for three hours looking at it and recorded how many times um, it striked. Um, so there are some estimates of that, but because it happened so fast, we can't quantify uh, different aspects of it, like what speed, what uh, angle did it catch the prey or not? Like sometimes it happens so fast you can't even see that. Other times it strikes and it goes behind a behind a coral or something, and you can't really see it. So so far the only way to do it to quantify this um, is through aquarium-based experiments where you have a controlled environment that you can film it uh, and so on. A follow-up question is. Is there like, are there like aquatic camera traps or something that you could like, are there, I'm just thinking of like passive ways you could maybe collect this data, like with it, some kind of video in the wild. Yeah, <laughs> the problem Again, with I the camera, know. yeah, so the problem with a camera trap is that um, you need, you need to have it set up in some way of like, extra battery system because underwater cameras are really expensive. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not aware of a study that has tried to do that. Um, I can't think um, of a study that's tried that, but you also need to think that it's motion sense. So like you're gonna have fish just swimming past and it's just going to start taking photos. Um, so even if you are able to get it, my guess is you're going to have thousands of photos where there's not actually a predation event happening. And if there, if there is one happening, it's going to be in an angle where it's going to, you know, it's not going to be laterally where you can measure things like the strike distance or the angle or, um, things like that. So yeah, I can definitely see some issues with yeah. that methodology as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It's almost a Sorry? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I also don't know anything about fish. but So I guess this might be a clarifying question, but also like a question with that. So like the most important predator is like the really small one. But like, when you think about, cause then it made me think about like top down control of these systems and how you can't eat anything that's bigger than you. Yeah. But then you have all these fish that are like, like, I'm just like, oh my God, if they're all that big, then so how, one, how do we get these fish? And what do, do the sharks eat the little ones or do they like eating big ones? Or like, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, Step, yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> but the one thing I didn't have time to go into is that there, there is a distinction between biomass related um, okay. feeding and numerical types of feeding. So, like in terms of who feeds on the most biomass, I don't know if it is these guys because you know sharks will feed on something that is much larger than a fish that is this big, right? But in terms of how many events would you expect to happen in this area of reef, those are the ones, yeah, exactly. So there's a, there's a bit of a distinction between uh, biomass versus numerical processes that I haven't had time to go into, but yeah.
thank you. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's just you essentially answer my question, but if you were to hazard a guess about how much of the trophic transfer is occurring through these cryptic small predators, what would you think it is? Is it still the majority of biomass or it's maybe not even close to that? That is one question that I really, really wanted to answer a lot of my PhD. I just ran out of time because this was like, literally uh, I was working on it uh, Five months before coming here to start my postdoc, so I was like, okay, I need to hand in my I thesis now. Well, yeah, well, my my guess, my guess would be a straight line. Okay. Yeah. Um, equally. Yeah. I, uh, that would be my my null hypothesis. Okay. Yeah. If it would be, if it was to be different, I think that would be such a cool study, and I would like to do it. But yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. So one of the things that's interesting about coral reef fish communities around globally is that they're not all the same. You were working in a place which is pretty close to the highest species diversity on the planet for reef fish. But you go to somewhere like the Carib any place in the Caribbean, there's a quarter of magnitude fewer species. Yeah. Um, and so I often wonder about how those differences in species richness affect sort of other aspects of diversity. And so here you have these sort of almost community scale sort of insights into um, the variation and predatory sort of strategies and morphologies and, and the prey. And if you've ever sort of thought about these kind of those kinds no, of scale it. comparisons, what do you think about specifically that comparison with the Caribbean? Yeah. So um, what you're saying right there is exactly one of the reasons that I initially wanted, got interested in the functional group aspect as it removes the species component. So it's like, okay, we have a group of fish that behave or do something in a similar way. So we might be able to apply it to not to a similar system, but for this particular chapter, the, the last one, um, because I thought we might run into issues like that, uh, I should have mentioned that this meta-analysis that I, that I did with the observations of gut contents and so on, I did it for only studies, studies based on the Indo-Pacific. So I removed all studies that had been done in the Red Sea or the, the Caribbean, specifically to avoid uh, making inferences that may or may not be the case. Um, and I don't know how the functional group. So just one thing about that. So are all the sort of functional groups that you identify in among piscivores and so forth in Lizard Island, are they present also in the Caribbean? I would think so, yeah. I don't know how many, I know there's pure planktivores uh, in, in, in the Caribbean, significantly less planktivores, and whether they're a behave in, the, in a similar manner. I, I haven't really um, thought of that, but I mean, it would be interesting to compare between the two and see what the differences are and what that might mean for the community and how this process occurs. No, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I had a, oh, sorry. Um, I had a question related to the gate size um, result. So, in your opinion, like how much of that do you think is being driven by body size? So that pelagic species are evolving larger body sizes. So they're that's how they overcome gape limitation. But then in how are they overcoming gape limitation with body size? Like they're just getting a larger, because you do it as a proportion to body size, right? Yeah. So they're just getting large. So they're not like increasing their gape per body size, they're just increasing their body size, which in yes. turn is increasing their gape. Yeah. Uh, versus benthic species, where are the small ones the ones that have the relatively large mouths per body size? So you're getting like benthic, small benthic species evolving larger body um, mouth sizes per body size, while larger body size species, you know, have proportionally small mouths. Did you see any evidence of that in your data no, set? No, because I didn't do any evolutionary, like evolutionary based analyses, because that's a whole like, different story. 
Like, yeah, but just based saying, on like your opinion, no, you think one, that? No idea. No idea. Like I, I, I didn't do any evolutionary based analyses because it's like, I just, in this situation, I was only like, okay, what's the gauge size? What can they feed on? Like how that evolved, I didn't have any time to look into. And at the time I wasn't really like looking into evolutionary stuff. Um, but I mean, again, yeah. interesting thing to look at. Great. Well, thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you next week. Yes, I was like, when I saw that thing.